question is is Dr. Aoife Iaria. Aoife Iaria is a solid organ transplant clinical pharmacy specialist at the Virginia Commonwealth University Health System, caring for kidney, liver, pancreas, and heart transplant recipients in both the inpatient and outpatient settings. She completed her doctorate in pharmacy at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and her PGY-1 acute care residency at Allegheny General Hospital in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and her PGY2 training here in solid organ transplant at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Dr. Iaria has served on the executive committee of the ACCP Transplant PRN as a trainee member from 2022 to 23 and has been actively involved in the various committees in the PRN since 2019. Uh, following Dr. Iaria, we'll have Dr. Nicholas Parrish, who received his BS Farm and PharmD degrees from Ohio State and was residency trained at Grant Medical Center in Columbus, Ohio. He is currently a clinical pharmacy specialist at the University of Cincinnati Medical Center, where he has worked with kidney and liver transplant programs for the past 20 years. So thank you both for being part of our program today, and we're excited to hear um, all you have to share on this hot topic. I'm going to give slide control over to you, Aoife. Okay, take it thank away. you thank so you. much, Jamie. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, looks like there's some information about CE credit, which we'll go over at the end. And jumping right in, so we'll be talking about a lot of different viral infections today. I will handle Hep C and COVID, and then Nick will take care of Hepatitis B and HIV. So our um, joint learning objectives for today are to explain the current screening of donors for these various infections, to discuss the published outcomes of recipients who receive these viral positive allografts, as well as to explain the clinical management of these patients after they receive these various allografts. So to begin, the whole reason that we're talking about this today is because we are all very much aware that there is a shortage of organs across all organ types. Wait lists have continued to rise over the last several years, and our patients are waiting months, if not years, to get their very much needed allograph. So over the last several years, there have been a variety of strategies that we've used in order to try to mitigate this organ shortage particularly by promoting organ donation awareness. In our kidney transplant patients, we have used expanded donor criteria kidneys by allowing the use of marginal kidneys, as well as optimizing living paired and altruistic donation strategies. And what we'll be focusing on today is the optimization of organ utilization. So using allografts that may not have been used historically that have various um, viral infections and optimizing our um, use of these allografts, preventing waste and trying to get more people the transplants that they need, and also xenotransplantation, which we will not necessarily be covering today. Starting first with hepatitis C. So hepatitis C is a single-stranded envelope positive sense RNA virus. It comes in six different genotypes with a variety of ways that it can be transmitted from person to person. Today, we will primarily be focusing on solid organ transplantation. Hepatitis C is seen all across the world, um, and the different genotypes that prevail can vary based on geographic location. So in the United States, we primarily see genotype 1, which is then followed by genotype 2 and 3. And we know that genotype 3 is one of the more difficult genotypes to treat, um, which often leads to higher risks of complications like steatosis, HCC, et cetera. Starting first with our donors, what are we checking in them prior to offering these allografts to our recipients? All transplant donors are checked for hepatitis C, both looking at their antibody test or anti-HCV, as well as hepatitis C RNA, or we also refer to it as nucleic acid testing, which is an assessment of viremia. All donors are screened within 96 hours of donation, um, and our recipients will have that information as they decide if they're willing to accept this allograft. When we have that information, we obviously need to be able to interpret it. So as a refresher for everyone, I'm sure most are familiar with this already, we'll be focusing primarily on um, the lower half of this 
chart here where antibody testing may be negative and NAP testing may be positive, which would be indicative of an acute infection or a false positive NAP test, as well as positive antibody screening and positive NAP testing, um, which is indicative of either an acute or chronic active infection. In our liver transplant recipients, we can sometimes see just um, hep C antibody positivity with um, no active viremia, which means that there was prior exposure to hepatitis C at some point. The AASLD guidelines do have specific recommendations for our transplant recipients and how we manage them after they receive a hepatitis C NAT positive allograft. And it really comes in two main strategies. The first is transmit and treat, where these patients are transplanted with a hepatitis C positive allograft. You wait for them to become viremic, and then you'll go ahead and start their testing. Versus a prophylactic approach, which is where often treatment is started before patients become viremic um, within the first several days, either before or after transplant. Um, and the goal is really to prevent any sort of transmission of disease. And this has really become prevalent as we have continued to see the numbers of hepatitis C positive allografts increase over the last several years. And this really started off with our kidney transplant population. So we'll dive pretty heavily into the kidney transplant data, but we'll touch on all allografts. So our first major study came out in 2017, the Thinker study, an open label single center pilot trial that included a handful of kidney transplant recipients who had no prior exposure to hepatitis C and all of them received a genotype one hepatitis C positive allograft. They were all treated with the Pattier for 12 weeks and all patients achieved SCR and had viral clearance by day 28. Um, all recipients did have detectable viral loads pretty early on within the first three days after transplant. With that data, we then moved into the expander trial in 2018, which followed a similar study design, included hepatitis C naive recipients. And this study differed from Thinker in the sense that it included pangenotypic um, hepatitis C viral donors. So not just genotype one that we saw in Thinker. With regards to treatment, all patients received the Pattier for 12 weeks, and anyone who was not genotype one also had the phosphobeer added to the mix. And interestingly, this was the first study where treatment was started preemptively. So started on post-op day zero prior to receiving the allograft, and outcomes overall were very positive. All patients achieved SCR um, and cleared their viral loads um, within about two weeks. Also, notably, seven patients never actually had detectable viral loads at any point in the study, showing that maybe starting earlier could prevent hepatitis C transmission entirely. I also wanted to point out that the Pattier was used um, in these studies just because of the timeline that it was all started. It was a little bit early um, for our direct acting pangenotypic antivirals to, to really take place. And then MYFIC in 2020 was an open label multi-center interventional trial, again, hepatitis C naive recipients and using similar to expander pangenotypic donors. Here, they broke into our pangenotypic agents with Maverick for eight weeks, which was the guideline recommendation at the time. Starting therapy at post-op day two through five, regardless of the presence of viremia. Again, all patients had achieved SCR and 23 patients out of the 30 actually did have detectable viral loads at some point during the study. With regards to allograft outcomes, renal function across the board was um, very similar um, and overall positive for all of our patients. Delayed graft function, you can see a handful of cases there. And the other thing that came out very early with regards to hepatitis C positive um, kidney transplantation was the concern for subsequent viral infections, specifically CMV and BK, which were seen in some of the earlier smaller studies, as well as case reports. Um, and so you can see there were a few patients in the MYFIC trial that did report the viral outcomes, um, but overall did not have any major complications. And then rejection episodes, there were a few of them um, in the MYFIC trial, none in expander, but overall a pretty low incidence there as well. Now, all of this information, particularly with our studies such as Expander that started treatments um, prior to transplants, 
suggest that the majority of patients who receive NAT positive um, allografts have an undetectable viral load, at least on post-op day one. So the thought being that can we move to a shorter, more prophylactic course of um, treatment or therapy in these patients by shortening their exposure to these drugs and preventing viral transmission altogether. So this is really hypothesized primarily because we have access to our pangenotypic direct acting antiviral agents. And interestingly, Abclusa, particularly in the context of kidney transplant patients, is not approved in patients with renal failure. But the thought being that short courses are very unlikely to cause any form of toxicity. And the pharmacokinetics um, would likely expose them to more drug with a, a higher AUC and potentially a slightly longer half-life because of their renal impairment. So the goal and the thought behind this ultra-short prophylaxis strategy being to prevent viral transmission and ultimately preventing any sort of subsequent complications as a result of hepatitis C. Which led us then to the DAPR trial in 2020. Now this took place in a couple of different phases. The first phase, which consisted of group one, um, these patients in this adaptive design single center trial um, had two prophylactic doses of Ebclusa that were given. So um, post-op day zero and post-op day one for a total of two doses with a variety of hep C monitoring afterwards and found that transmission rates were about 30%. From there, they decided to expand the duration of the prophylactic regimen to four total doses, again, starting prior to transplant. And that cut the transmission rate down by over 50%, down to 13%. And then group 2B was really the confirmation arm to make sure that the information that they saw in group 2A was accurate. And they actually found about a 4% transmission rate. Um, so overall, when you look at the study as a whole, so about an average of 12% transmission um, across the board with this prophylactic strategy. Looking at outcomes, again, you'll see a lot of similarities between this prophylactic regimen and patients who received a full course of treatment. So overall, great renal function across the board. Um, they did have a pretty large number of patients with delayed graft function. However, the majority of those patients did resolve. Two out of the 50 patients total had um, acute rejection, and then three cases of de novo DSA formation, um, which was not clearly reported in a lot of the other studies that we talked about. Now, I am very fortunate to actually practice at the center where we did this study. So I am a pharmacist at VCU. So it's kind of cool to see how this study that happened before my time um, kind of laid the foundation for what we are doing now currently. So our protocol, if patients are consenting to hepatitis C positive transplantation, they will receive their first dose of Abclusa prior to the, going to the OR. And then we have since expanded that prophylactic regimen to a seven-day total course. So they'll receive six days after they receive their kidney transplant. Afterwards, our patients are typically discharged on post-op day three or four, and we are able to supply them with the remainder of their prophylactic regimen at no cost to the patient through our discharge pharmacy. And we invoice that to the transplant center um, at the end of every month. So we do as a center cover this for our patients. We'll continue to serially monitor them as we did in the study. And if we have two consecutive hepatitis C um, positive RNA tests, they do get referred to hepatology for a full course of treatment um, with very close follow-up from our hepatology colleagues. Moving now into liver transplant, um, we will kind of briefly go through a lot of these other allografts just for sake of time. Um, but the main point being that we are also doing this in liver transplant patients, both with viremic donors as well as non-viremic donors. This study I really liked because it had a variety of direct acting antiviral agents that were used. Um, Maverick was preferred, but they were pretty flexible and made it very real world with um, facing treatment off of patient's insurance approval. Overall, anyone who received a viremic donor did have detectable viral loads. They started treatment within about a month, and all of the patients achieved SCR. And overall, there weren't any major complications um, as a result of the hepatitis C within this study. 
Moving into our thoracic allografts, one of the earlier studies came out of Vanderbilt in 2018 and included specifically heart transplant patients um, who received genotype one or three positive donors. The majority of them had been naive to hepatitis C, but one had prior exposure. You can see the treatments there based on genotype and overall um, the majority of patients did have detectable viral loads. The start time was a little bit later compared to some of our other studies, so closer to 39 days, but they also didn't become viremic until about 32 days, which was quite interesting compared to some of our other studies. You can see um, one patient did not achieve SDR, and that's where you see that 24-week course of Abclusa, so they extended it out, and ultimately, they did um, achieve viral clearance, just not at the 12-week mark. Donate hep -C, um, was also published in 2020. This included heart and lung transplant patients. Majority of the patients were actually lung, which is pretty exciting, and they utilized Abclusa um, treatment, only a four-week course here, but they did start it on post-op day zero. Um, you can see the majority of patients did um, have a detectable viral load. And this study actually did so well that within the um, first six months, they met their stopping boundary for efficacy. So they had 35 patients who had six month follow-up. All patients survived, all patients had SDR, um, and all patients cleared any detectable virus by day 14, um, which was a really nice study for a thoracic uh, side of things. And then there was a systematic review in 2022 um, that was published with a significant number of patients in there. Overall, as we've already mentioned, all patients achieved SDR, survival rates were high, and there weren't any major complications. Um, all of the deaths that they saw were uh, not associated with hepatitis C whatsoever. So to summarize Hep C, it is kind of a beast of a topic to do in about 10 to 15 minutes, um, but we have really changed the landscape of being able to utilize Hep C positive allografts because of direct acting antiviral agents that have really changed the way we can do Hep C transplant. We're currently transplanting livers, kidneys, hearts, and lungs, and there are still lots of things we don't know, but lots of studies that are ongoing. Um, to really give us a full picture of how we can continue to progress and maybe even shorten therapy for our patients in the future. Transitioning now into COVID-19. So I think everyone in this Zoom is more than familiar with COVID-19. It is a severe acute respiratory syndrome, um, also known as SARS-CoV-2. It's a positive sense single-stranded RNA virus that predominantly is transmitted via airborne and droplet routes. Um, and what we have found over the last couple of years is that viral RNA can be detected in a variety of cells, specifically hepatocytes, renal tubular cells, the myocardium, which led us to have a lot of questions about um, when we transplant patients, will they become viremic? And what we have learned since then is as long as you're not transplanting a lung, the rates of viral transmission are quite low. The impact of COVID-19, I think for anyone that was practicing at the time, saw this almost immediately. Um, COVID-19 really halted a lot of things, particularly within the realm of transplant, not just because we didn't know how the virus would impact our immunocompromised patients, but also just logistically our staff was being pulled to do other things in this unprecedented time. So we saw a great reduction specifically in 2020 of living donors, both in kidney and liver. But after that year, we saw things start to uptrend again, mainly because we had a better idea of the virus, what it was capable of, how we could mitigate it, and we also had vaccination at that point as well. So for donor screening, deceased donors, it is not required to test all donors for COVID-19. I will say that most centers are testing for COVID um, prior to donation. The exception to this is lung transplant. All lung transplant donors must have a lower respiratory specimen collected and resulted prior to making those lungs available for transplantation. Living donation, it is highly recommended for um, donors and recipients to get tested. And if they are positive, it is recommended to delay that surgery until, um, especially for the recipient, but also for the donor if um, 
if they're positive. So digesting COVID data, it is still very much emerging. We're still learning a lot about this, but I think the easiest way to look at it is to break it down into a couple of different phases. So phase one was the very early phase when we had donors who we knew had previously been infected with COVID long, long ago, um, but had subsequently recovered and have died of something else. Then we moved into phase two, where we were getting a little more brave and we used lower risk donors who had a history of COVID infection in the past and still had antibodies to COVID present. So we know that they had a fairly recent case of COVID potentially, um, but again, very low risk patients. Versus now phase three, we're still using low risk donors, um, but they may still be testing positive for COVID. And there are a few recommendations out there as to what patients might be more equipped for donation versus those who may not. So patients with a higher cycle threshold, patients who have had a longer amount of time since their positive COVID test, mild disease, um, imaging that is more positive um, and no concerns of thrombosis or acute respiratory distress syndrome. And with these transitions and phases, you can see how our comfort continued to increase as we started to use more COVID positive donors. And this is even outdated now. This only dates up to August of 2021. And that number has only continued to rise over the last almost two years. The American Society of Transplantation does have some recommendations as to the management and use of COVID positive donors. They do say um, donors who are positive who died of COVID-19 attributable complications can and should be considered for transplantation, just not lung transplantation. However, they do very clearly acknowledge the fact that we do not have a lot of long-term data with these allograft types. Um, and so if there are concerns, centers should proceed with caution. One of the biggest studies that is out there came out um, in, I believe, 2022 um, in transplant infectious disease. And this looked at UNOS database outcomes of 139 COVID positive donors that um, reached 413 COVID negative recipients. It included kidneys, livers, hearts, and they did a really nice comparison of these donors versus COVID negative donors. And overall, what we found was that these donors were younger from the kidney side of things. They had lower KDPI scores and lower serum creatinine. For liver, they were very comparable with regards to bilirubin. And our heart transplant patients also were comparable with regards to ejection fraction at the time of transplant. We did see higher rates of BCD donors in patients or donors were COVID positive, and we did see some longer cold times as well. But overall, with regards to the um, use of these allografts, there was no increased risk of mortality or organ dysfunction when compared to COVID negative donors, and no patients in this study of 413 recipients had viral transmission attributable to their donor. Additional considerations, obviously this is a very new virus. We are still learning things about this every single day, but the data that we have is overwhelmingly positive, um, but we are lacking those long-term outcomes data, particularly um, with all allografts. And there also have been some um, statements regarding concerns for thrombosis for patients who receive COVID-19 allografts. A lot of this stems from case reports, and a lot of these case reports have multiple confounding factors. So within the largest study that I showed you, there was no association with thrombosis. So it is something that patients um, and clinicians should be cognizant of. However, it hasn't been described in the stronger literature. So to summarize COVID-19, the pandemic, as we all know, has and continues to alter the landscape of solid organ transplantation. We um, are always going to be wanting more long-term data, which will come with time um, with regards to our COVID-positive transplants. We are transplanting um, non-lung COVID donors, um, and these short-term outcomes have very positive outcomes as compared with those who receive COVID-negative allografts. And there are ongoing trials for all allografts except for our lungs at this point. 
with that, I will hand it on over to my co-presenter, Nick. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'll pick up where Aoife left off and move to expanding the donor pool through the use of hepatitis B and HIV positive organs. Um, as we all know, hepatitis B is a double-stranded DNA virus of the hepatinavirae family. Um, approximately one-third of the world's population shows past or current evidence of HPV infection, so very widespread world worldwide. Um, an estimated 350 to 400 million um, have evidence of chronic HPV infection today. Um, although, although in Western countries, the prevalence is much lower due to vaccination, um, in the US, the rates are less than 2% and declining. Um, although we still do see upwards of 13,000 new cases of Hep B per year in our country. Um, as we know, Hep B is treatable but not curable. Um, largely, that's due to the persistence of the covalently closed circular DNA or CCC DNA, which persists long term in hepatocytes. Uh, fortunately, vaccination is effective in preventing infection, however. Historically, hepatitis B positive donors were excluded due to potential risks, which included uh, concern for acute fulminant hepatitis soon after um, organ transplantation due to um, reactivation of the virus with immunosuppression, the development of long-term chronic Hep B infection leading to cirrhosis or hepatocellular carcinoma, and other barriers including cost and potential adverse drug effects of medications or the potential transmission risk to others. There we go. Um, early experience with hepatitis B positive donors was largely um, isolated core positive um, organs, which um, began really through the 1990s and into the early 2000s, um, as we had the advent of anti-hepatitis B medications, including hepatitis B immune globulin and some early antiviral medications. Um, the core um, antibody positive donation was largely successful. Um, which led to the um, convening of a consensus expert panel um, by AST, which published a set of guidelines in 2015 shown here. Um, so for anybody new to this topic who wants to start off and gain some in um, valuable information, this is a great place to start, a good resource. Um, I'll step through some of the major recommendations here in my next few slides, as well as going over some of the um, published data since these were published in 2015. Additionally, we have regulatory requirements, and Aoife touched on that earlier with hepatitis C, um, but we have bodies including the U.S. Public Health Service, the CDC, and OPTN, which publish regulatory requirements for us. So for anybody who's intimately involved with um, the regulation at your transplant center, um, perhaps involved with QAPI, um, those are some resources you really need to look into closer to become intimately familiar with the requirements there. Um, but in general, these policies dictate required testing both for recipients and for donors, as well as the specific timer of both the donor and recipient screening, um, as well as ongoing post-transplant monitoring for the development of these uh, diseases. Most notably, um, the most recent update was in 2020 from PHS, um, which had um, some of the recommendations that, again, Aoife mentioned earlier about screening for our recipients um, right around the time of transplantation. Um, the specific donor screening required for hepatitis B, we've had required screening of the core antibody and surface antigen for our organ donors for many years. Um, the change more recently was the advent of nucleic acid testing, um, which allowed us to detect um, exposure to hepatitis B in our donors um, more rapidly than when those other serologic tests would become positive um, to shorten that window period. Um, so initially, some transplant centers or OPOs began doing nucleic acid testing on their own, and more recently, um, NAT, hep, hep B NAT testing became required. Currently at listing, transplant candidates may opt out of the receipt of Hep B core positive, surface antigen positive, and or NAT positive donors. 
Um, so that's something that um, should be integrated into the process in everyone's transplant center um, as patients are being evaluated for transplant to have an informed discussion if your transplant center is willing to um, use some of these organs that that is discussed um, with the patient so they're aware and consent to the um, receipt of those organs. Um, despite consent at the time of listing, we must also consent patients at the time of an organ offer when potentially using an organ that is surface antigen and or NAT positive um, for hepatitis B. Next, I'll step through some of the different serologic categories of our donors and discuss the transmission risk of each. And I'll follow that up with the current recommendations and some of the literature to support um, prevention strategies. Um, donors who are only hepatitis B surface antibody positive with all other testing being negative simply reflect a vaccinated status and should transmit no risk of hepatitis B in solid or organ transplantation. On the flip side, uh, donors who are hepatitis B core antibody positive um, would have some risk, especially in liver transplantation. Um, the first group who are surface antibody and core antibody positive reflect natural immunity, um, should not carry a risk with most organs, but do have a significant risk in the liver, again, with the persistence of the um, CCC DNA in those hepatocytes. Whereas isolated core antibody positive most often reflects resolved infection and uh, an immune status, rarely could represent an occult or resolving infection or potentially a false positive. Um, again, that would carry a significant risk of transmission in liver transplantation and a low risk in other organs, but positive. And finally, hepatitis B surface antigen or NAT positive donors represent the highest transmission risk group um, hepatitis B surface antigen positive um, with NAT negative would be infected, yet not viremic or at least a very low level of viremia below the level of detection. And the highest risk uh, would be in the um, actively viremic patients where nucleic acid um, testing is positive, uh, whether or not the surface antigen has yet become positive. Uh, we have a variety of different prevention options that, um, available at this point, um, certainly vaccination, which is recommended to all uh, candidates for transplantation prior to transplant, as well as the hepatitis B immune globulin or HBIG, and our antivirals in the nucleoside, nucleotide analog categories, including older drugs such as lamivudine and adefavir, and the newer versions in tecavir and the tenofovir, disaproxyl, and alafenamide dosage forms, which have a lower genetic barrier to resistance. I'll start with our isolated core positive donors, um, specifically with liver transplantation. Um, as mentioned before, this carries a significant transmission risk, even in vaccinated uh, recipients, with uh, the one rare exception of our recipients who may be naturally immune and seem to exhibit a very low transmission, even in without um, prevention strategies there. Um, a variety of early studies um, were published in the um, 1990s into the early 2000s with our core positive livers. And uh, this evidence was compiled in a systematic analysis by Catherine Skagen and coll colleagues in 2011. Um, and the biggest takeaway to me from this was that the risk of uh, de novo hepatitis um, in recipients of core positive livers were quite low, especially in the group taking lamivudine, um, where 11% um, rate was seen in the non-immune patients. Um, but only a 2% rate in vaccinated patients. And so a few years later, when the um, expert panel convened, the recommendation based on some of this uh, data compiled in that summary um, said that antivirals were recommended indefinitely for our non-immune recipients of a core positive liver. Uh, for immune recipients, we can consider discontinuation of antivirals after one year, provided immune immunity persists. Um, the panel recommended lamivudine as being first line at the time due to its cost effectiveness. However, entecavir or tenofovir may be considered due to the high genetic barrier to resistance, knowing that that had become the first line drug for chronic hepatitis B patients. Um, and I will note that in, in the time since these guidelines were um, released, um, the cost for some of these drugs, especially entecavir and tenofovir disaproxyl, have come down um, to be similar to lamivudine in many cases. <clears throat> 
Um, on the um, on the other side, H big whether alone or in combination with antivirals, did not appear to provide significant protection to a core positive liver and was not recommended in the guidelines. Looking at other solid, solid organ transplantations in a core positive donor, um, the transmission risk again is very low and even negligible in our immune recipients. So the guidelines recommend um, consideration of use of these organs after a risk benefit assessment and informed consent of the patient. Also, no prophylaxis is recommended for immune recipients of core positive organs. Um, however, antiviral prophylaxis may be considered up to one year in our non-immune recipients. And again, with HBIG, insufficient data to recommend that agent. Moving to our surface antigen positive donors, um, all organs here. Um, transmission is likely from an antigen positive donor. And consideration still may be um, given to the risk benefit before use, as well as informed consent being required. Especially with liver transplant, histology is recommended to be verified before using to ensure that there's no evidence of chronic liver disease due to the hepatitis B virus. Um, prophylaxis is recommended with entecavir or tenofovir, in this case, indefinitely for all organs. Additionally, consideration should be given for addition of HBIG when the recipient Hep B surface antibody titers are less than 100 in all organs. And um, since the guidelines were published in 2015, we have seen an uptick in use of hepatitis B surface antigen positive organs. Um, this diagram is showing the liver usage um, with the darkest shading being the utilized organs. And we've indeed gone up from um, less than five a year up to closer to 20 per year um, as of the latest data. Um, additionally, this publication I'm showing here did look at the survival um, and patient survival was comparable in these um, recipients compared to recipients of hepatitis C positive, DCD donors, and even average risk donors. Um, so again, very little um, numbers, um, early data, but the evidence seems to be quite good. And I'm only showing the livers here, but we've seen some um, positive results in other solid organs as well. Uh, so what about our actively viremic or NAT positive donors? Um, we have some evidence out of my institution here in Cincinnati, um, published a couple of years ago with some early use. Um, again, the NAT positivity um, testing was only more recently done, and so we didn't have as much evidence until more recently with this patient population. Um, and the transmission risk when uh, the patient, when the donor is actively viremic is thought to be much higher. Uh, so we looked at 33 liver and 56 kidney recipients without HBV infection who received the NAT positive organs. All patients in this series were vaccinated, but were included regardless of their response to vaccination. Um, when compared with NAT negative recipients from the same time period, I'm showing the demographics here first for the liver group, um, very similar between groups other than recipients of NAT positive livers had a lower BMI, a higher terminal ALT, and were more likely from a national share. Similarly, with the kidney group, um, recipients of NAT positive kidneys had a lower BMI and were more likely from a national share. The prevention strategy used in this study in our liver patients was entecavir 0.5 milligrams daily, starting the day of transplantation and continued indefinitely. Additionally, HBIG 10,000 units was given on the day of transplant for non-immune recipients only. On the kidney side of the study, entecavir was again used uh, daily starting the day of transplantation and continued for a duration of one year. On the left, you see the breakdown of the patients in this study divided into the kidney and liver transplant recipients, and then divided further into NAT positive donors and NAT negative donors. Um, at the bottom, you see the rates of NAT positivity at the end of the follow-up period in both the kidney and liver groups. And you see a 0% rate of NAT positivity in the kidneys and only 2 or 6.1% um, in the liver population. Um, we did see HBV viremia transiently during the study follow-up period in this, um, both the kidney and the liver side, but the majority, um, as you see there by the end of the follow-up period, became negative. And although the follow-up period in the study is still short, only a median of 13 months of follow-up, um, as you see on the right side, the patient survival across the top 
um, in the kidney and graft survival, and at the bottom with the liver patient and liver graft survival, um, were comparable comparing HBV NAT positive and NAT negative donors. Additionally, since the intent of this study was to increase the, um, the donor pool and potentially find organs to get patients off of the wait list quicker, uh, this group looked at the wait list duration and time on dialysis for the kidney patients. And they did see a significant uh, decrease in the wait list duration as well as the time on dialysis being cut nearly in half. Um, certainly that could confer a mortality benefit too, as we know the mortality of waitlisted patients on dialysis, 20% um, within the first year roughly. So um, whether or not that could confer that mortality benefit and the whole reason why we're looking to expand our donor pool, of course. On the liver side of the study, while there was a slight uh, decrease in the waitlist duration, that did not achieve statistical significance. Uh, so the current state of hepatitis B positive donors is that organs from isolated core positive donors, regardless of the recipient's hepatitis B surface antibody status, should be considered for all adult candidates. Um, that should be an individual risk benefit decision and should require patient consent by regulatory requirements. Um, unfortunately, um, I didn't present any data in pa pediatrics because that data is still very limited. And so the recommendations in the guidelines is that that should only be considered in emergent settings in low prevalence areas, such as in our country. Um, the yearly experience with the more risky transmission, the hepatitis B surface antigen and NAP positive organs, even including liver transplantation is promising, but we still really need some more long-term outcomes um, to tease out the long-term transmission risks. Okay, I'll move on to HIV. Um, and HIV, um, first of all, the use of organs from HIV positive or suspected positive donors was banned by the National Organ Transplant Act shortly after the um, onset of the HIV pandemic in the early 80s. So by 1988, the use of HIV positive donors was banned um, by that act of Congress. However, following more effective HIV therapies, um, as we saw the mortality of HIV positive uh, patients falling uh, throughout the 1990s and into the early 2000s, um, attitudes began to shift about the transplant candidacy, candidacy of HIV positive patients, given that these patients were able to live longer lives and um, healthier lives. Um, additionally, we had an increasing number of surviving HIV patients who had end organ disease needing transplantation. So the, the need was really there for this subset of uh, recipients. Um, some of the best early experience in HIV recipients receiving transplantation came from the HIV Transplant Recipient or HIV TR study published in 2011. And this looked at 150 HIV positive kidney transplant recipients. Um, these patients had to be stable um, to be included in the study, including a CD4 count greater than 200, an undetectable viral load, and be on a stable HIV regimen. Um, the results of the study were very promising, showing acceptable patient and graft survival, as well as similar rates of complications other than an increased risk of rejection rates um, compared to non-HIV historical controls. Um, fortunately, um, HIV did remain well controlled um, in the patients in this study, despite the immunosuppression they received post-transplant. Um, around this time, there were also case reports of successful HIV negative to HIV positive transplantation in a variety of other organs. And um, across the, the board, the outcomes were really consistent with the HIV TR experience, that um, the outcomes of the transplantation themselves were successful, complications were relatively comparable to non-HIV patients, um, other than maybe a slightly increased risk of rejection. Um, as a result, AST guidelines were published in 2019, um, including from um, our very own Kristen Rogers and the transplant pharmacy community. Um, the suggested criteria for patients um, undergoing transplantation were similar to what we had seen with the HIV TR inclusion criteria. So CD4 count greater than 200, perhaps lower in livers if no history of opportunistic infections an undetectable HIV viral load, again, with one exception being in the liver population, if the detectable viral load was thought to be due to antiretroviral therapy intolerance. 
adherence to a stable a ART regimen um, was required and avoidance of protease inhibitors where possible, absence of OIs or malignancy, absence of chronic wasting or malnutrition, appropriate ID follow-up, and access to frequent immunosuppression therapeutic drug monitoring, particularly in patients who were on a protease inhibitor-based regimen where the drug interactions were more likely. Um, so since the um, early experience with HIV negative to HIV positive um, transplantation was successful, what about, again, trying to expand our donor pool to include HIV positive donors? Um, as we knew, the wait list mortality in our HIV positive candidates was higher, and so there was that need to expand the donor pool within this group. And we also had a subset of unused HIV positive and false positive organs. Uh, the first experience in this group came from um, South Africa, uh, where a research group there looked at 27 HIV positive to positive kidney transplants. They did use similar inclusion criteria to what we'd seen before and did see very successful results in their patients, both in patient and graft survival. Acute rejection rates were also acceptable at 8% within one year and 22% at three years. And again, as we saw previously, HIV remained well suppressed despite immunosuppression. So with this early experience, um, we wanted to check on the feasibility of HIV positive to positive transplantation in the United States through more study. Um, despite a little bit of early evidence, there was still certainly concern about more widespread adoption of this um, in terms of HIV, HIV super infection with immunosuppression. Um, as well as transmissions of different HIV strains from the donor to the recipient, um, particularly in the United States, as resistant, resistance rates with HIV were higher than what was seen in South Africa. Um, drug interactions, again, with the protease inhibitors and our CNIs or mTORs, um, especially in the United States, which may have a wider variety of regimens being used for these resistant patients. And although the early experience was good, still wanted more data on infections and malignancy in this patient population who are already prone to those um, issues. Um, as a result of the desire for more study um, and the fact that um, use of HIV positive organs was still banned in this country, uh, transplant advocates pushed through the HOPE Act in 2013. So the HOPE Act or HIV Organ Procurement Equity Act was developed under the leadership of the U.S. Health and Human Services Secretary um, and is still ongoing and administered by the NIH and OPTN. This allows for HIV positive to positive transplantation in the U.S. under strict IRB approved protocols. Um, patients in this study can be listed both for HIV positive and HIV negative donors, and it also allows for HIV positive to positive living donation. Under the HOPE Act, individual transplant centers must register, must get local IRB approval, and follow the strict protocols mentioned. Uh, criteria for the HOPE Act um, are lay in six different categories that participating centers must follow, as you see here. So including donor eligibility, recipient eligibility, transplant hospital criteria, OPO responsibilities, prevention of HIV transmission, and study design required outcome measures. And we do have early results with the HOPE study published in kidney and liver transplantation over the past couple of years. Um, the results on the kidney side are shown here um, with 91% of patients coming into transplant being on an integrase inhibitor containing regimen. Uh, 57 donors have been used um, in this published data, including 15 HIV positive, 14 HIV false positive, and 28 HIV negative. And that includes some HIV positive donors who were not even on any antiretroviral therapy at the time and who had detectable viremia. Uh, the patient survival in this group uh, was 100%, and graft survival was comparable um, at, at and high between donor positive and donor negative groups. Um, no difference was seen in rejection between the two groups, as well as in serious adverse events. Uh, we did also see very low rates of HIV breakthrough, and when we did see that, it was felt to be related to insurance issues and a lapse in antiretroviral meds in those patients. Um, similarly, on the liver side, um, good results there as well, too. 93% of these patients were on an integrase inhibitor-containing regimen. 
45 donors were used, 24 of which were HIV positive, 10 false positives. Uh, the weighted one-year survival, um, in this case, the donor um, positive group has, was actually statistically lower than the donor, donor negative group, as you see there, 83% versus 100%. Um, although again, the numbers are quite low still at this point. No significant differences were seen in our donor positive versus donor negative in terms of graft survival though, um, as well as rejection or HIV breakthrough. Um, more opportunistic infections were seen as well as infectious hospitalizations and malignancies in the donor positive group. So still additional data is warranted here on the liver side moving forward. So currently, the state of donor positive to recipient positive HIV transplantation includes many challenges, including the complex process involved, our limited experience, um, as well as the lack of awareness that HIV positive individuals can register as or organ donors. So our pool of potential donors um, is still lower than it can be just because of that lack of awareness and the need for education um, to HIV positive individuals in the community. Um, privacy concerns of potential donors, as well as the, the ongoing stigma and fear of transplanting HIV positive donors in the medical community also persist as challenges to us. Um, however, much of the early experience with HIV transplantation has been positive clinically, um, and we have seen an early expansion of that donor pool, including the use of those false, pos false positive organs that otherwise would not have been used, and two live donor kidneys to date have been transplanted. And so currently, HIV positive to positive transplantation continues to be allowed under the HOPE Act. All right, thank you. At this time, we can take any questions. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Yaria and Dr. Parrish. To start off, one question that came through the chat is for Dr. Yaria. Uh, for Hep C, Donor positive recipient negative kidney transplants at VCU is the seven day um, antiviral course per standard institutional protocol or are patients enrolled into a study? Um, it sounds like other institutions have considered this, but are wondering how to do consent since seven days is not the standard of care. Yeah, so great question. Um, when we were doing the DAPR study, which was before my time, that was definitely under a study protocol. And then based on our results from the um, DAPR study, they were able to standardize an institutional protocol. So when we're consenting patients on the pre-side, they are uh, made very much aware of our protocol and that it does deviate from standard of care, um, but they're also presented with the data that we have internally as well. So they don't have to consent to a hepatitis C positive um, allograft but it is something that, that we're doing outside of a study protocol. We're still retrospectively looking back on everything as well, um, and hopefully we'll have more data to continue to support this out soon. Fantastic, and while we are on this topic, um, another question is if the transplant department or the pharmacy department is covering that seven-day course, um, and if that's a permanent agreement or something that's going to be reevaluated. Yeah, we are very fortunate. Our transplant department has been very supportive of this. Um, and so in order to really, it was essentially a question of, do we keep them in the hospital for their full seven day course or do we discharge them and essentially cover the cost of the drug, which we would be doing potentially anyway if they stayed. So we kind of decided as an institution that financially it just made more sense to discharge our patients on time. Um, and then, you know, provide them with the, the next three or four days of prophylaxis as needed. It's wonderful that your institution sees the value in that and you can get your patients out the door. I think yes. probably a struggle I know that's for many. Definitely <laughs> a, a tricky piece. Yes, for sure. Um, and again, along these lines, sorry, I'll try and stay on one topic before we switch over, but uh, what transmission rate are you seeing with the seven day course? Yeah, also a great question. Um, we have a handful of um, breakthrough trans transmission rates. Um, we have a handful. I think right now we have done over 150 kidneys and maybe have about eight that we've seen breakthrough. Um, and that's actually something that we're specifically going back and looking at now, particularly, particularly looking at any confounders. So did these patients miss their pre-op dose? 
Were they on a PPI that may have confounded the amount of drugs that they were receiving and trying to figure out, was it maybe even like a resistant hepatitis C donor that they received and they were bound to break through from the start anyway. So those are all things that we're actively looking at right now. So we'll have hopefully more details on that um, very soon, but overall low transmission rates, which is very reassuring. Yeah, that's wonderful. And we, I'm sure I'll look forward to seeing that data published in the near future. Um, and for Dr. Parrish, um, with the hepatitis B consent happening at the time of listing, and then a pharmacist coming to counsel on post-transplant medications that will often include entecavir, um, sometimes pharmacists are encountering patients who are upset and forget that they consented to receiving these organs. Um, does your team ever come across this and have a better process, like the surgeon talking to the patient about hep B at the time of transplant? Yeah, um, we do definitely do encounter that. So, you know, I've encountered that myself as a discharge pharmacist counseling patients too. Um, certainly, we we make sure that that in, informed consent is documented both in the evaluation step um, as well as the perioperative. I think that's where we saw the most lapses is that perioperative phase and. And sometimes um, information is maybe not communicated as clearly, or patients are certainly just overwhelmed with everything going on as they're being called in for a transplant too. So um, that really just required some communication and feedback um, given back to the, the folks doing those um, discussion in our coopies um, and just trying to make those um, in, uh, encounters as clear as possible, including the um, caregivers as well on the pre-transplant evaluation discussions too, um, and the documentation of um, of that consent is extremely important, obviously, just um, to cover yourselves too. But um, you know, we do our best certainly to make sure that um, there aren't any surprises come discharge then. Sort of along those lines, when you are consenting patients for hep B organs, um, did you discuss the potential costs of the antiviral therapy in the long term? I know there's a lot of controversy when you, a lot of publicity with the hep C meds and their costs, but I think probably underappreciated is the long-term cost of the hep B agent. So I just was curious if there's any conversations about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, conversations are probably not as detailed, I would imagine, as they could be, but certainly um, pointing out that those are lifelong medications in some cases is extremely important and um, is happening at our institution for sure. Um, we do also have it built into our protocol to allow some flexibility with the choice of med two between entecavir and tenofovir, um, the different dosage forms too that we're we're comfortable with too, and even lamivudine may be um, an option, especially for the shorter courses for patients who really have a cost um, issue. Um, um, fortunately, that hasn't really led to um, too many issues with that flexibility here. Uh, we've been able to convert from tenofovir, which um, TAF is currently our first line drug, but back to an um, and Tecavir really in the majority of cases where cost has become an issue um, or tapping into potentially some other resources um, if the long-term cost becomes an issue. But yeah, your, your point is very well taken that that really should be something that's addressed with the patients up front, um, particularly when they have that option of, of opting in or opting out of the choice of those organs. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, I think those are all of the questions I see that have come through the chat. Um, anyone can feel free to add anything else. Um, but thank you both very, very much for these really helpful and insightful presentations. I think obviously a lot going on in these areas and we look forward to seeing some more of these results published um, in the coming months, two years. Um, we do have another break. Um, this break will end at 9.17 Pacific time, 11.17. Um, Central and then 1217 um, Eastern, really making me do my math on a Saturday morning. Um, and just a reminder that the credits for these CEs will be available through a link that will be emailed to you at the um, conclusion of all the presentations. And you will need to create an account through Rush and we'll send a PDF for the information on as to how to do that. Um, but thank you again um, to both of our speakers for fantastic presentations and taking time out of your Saturday morning. Um, and we'll let you all grab some coffee or go to the bathroom in between our next presentation. All right, thank you. Thank you.